Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my live uh, masterclass uh, podcast in which I'm going to be talking about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, how it should work, what should be its uh, requirements, and why it's so important to have it. Um, I have been part of the team that has been uh, elaborating a proposal in the European Parliament. I was in charge of the opinion of the Economics Committee, and thus I am uh, going to explain you what we learned. Uh, what, why do we think the design should be the one that we are proposing? Um, so there will be four parts to this uh, masterclass. We're going to talk about why we need a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Second, we're going to talk about what would be the right way to design it. Third, we're going to have the legislative steps that we need to take uh, to make the CBIM work. And finally, we're going to have a, a Q and A. That's the plan, and I hope you enjoy it. The um, first question that we need to uh, think about is what is there? Uh, why is there a need for the carbon border adjustment mechanism? What is it, and why do we need something like that? And then we will talk about how to design. The basic um, question that you all know, and that is ba is at the root of all our climate change policy, is that we think we face a very, very large challenge uh, as humanity, as the planet, as a result of global warming. We believe that global warming is going to exceed, uh, scientists believe it's going to exceed the two degree level um, and maybe could even as high as five degrees. If, if we go to five degrees, it's going to be completely catastrophic. Uh, such a rise in global temperature will have devastating effects on, on ecosystems, on biodiversity, but, but also on, on the ability of large fringes of the Earth, the uh, areas around uh, the equator could become in, uninhabitable with the consequences that are only uh, imaginable right now. So I think it's pretty clear that from the perspective of, of humanity, climate change is a global challenge that requires a global response. Um, the problem is that climate is a public good. No individual country can affect it. What do we mean by a public good? A public good is a, a good that you cannot exclude others from consuming and that is non-rival in the sense that what I consume doesn't reduce what you consume. Think of national defense. I mean, if we had just each one pays for their own soldiers, then I would benefit from the soldiers you pay. And you couldn't exclude me from benefiting from the peace that the soldiers that a few other people are, are, are preserving. Um, so <clears throat> climate change is like that. Um, if you are a small country, um, if all the countries are really very serious about fighting climate change, you're going to benefit from that. Uh, you're not going to, they're not going to be able to dump all the CO2 in each, in your particular country. Uh, the CO2 floats around uh, the globe and everybody benefits from the efforts that other people uh, undertake. This is called a free riding problem. Uh, I can free ride as a particular country, my country can free ride on the efforts of others. And that's why it's very, very hard to make any mechanism work. That's why any mechanism that we put in place is going to be subject to this risk. Look at what has happened to greenhouse emissions over the last uh, few decades. Since 1990 until today, um, we have an, an increase of 41% in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have seen them go from uh, a, a very already large level that was already increasing uh, carbon and that was leading to, for example, the Kyoto Protocol in the 90s at 35 million tons of CO2 equivalent to 50,000 uh, uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent. So it's a 41 increase. It's like there is an increase of 2.2% a year. Is that because all countries were uh, increasing their emissions? No. Look at Europe. What you see is that Europe has had more than a 25, it's in dark blue in the right picture, the right hand picture that, that you see. And it's had actually quite a bit of success in fighting uh, global warming. We've had a 25% cut in CO2 emissions. Um, the US has been more or less flat. We've seen an increase in India. We've seen some drop also, significant drop in Russia. What we have seen is a gigantic increase in emissions by China, which has gone from 3,000 
million tons or three billion ton of of, of uh, CO two equivalent to eleven and a half. Um, so it's a very very large uh, increase uh, multiplied by basically almost three, and that negates all the effort that other countries can do. That's the problem with free riding. Um, to some extent, if you think of it from a purely rational perspective, a small country can think, look, what I do is not going to make a difference. If you guys are doing the effort, I'm going to benefit the same. If you're not doing it, my effort is not going to count. So you can really not avoid the, the free riding uh, if you operate individually. So what countries, what, what the world has tried to do is to put in place uh, a couple of protocols and agreements which are non-binding, which is strictly vol voluntary, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, trying to limit uh, global emissions. As you see, there is really no evidence in the left-hand uh, side graph that the world is actually managing to contain these emissions. There's a little, maybe, bump at the end, but it's really not significant. The European Union has acted very strongly, as we saw in the graph. We set up very ambitious targets in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, the European Union uh, in 2008 already had a very ambitious target of reducing greenhouse by 20% in 2020. And indeed, in increasing the share of renewables and making an improvement in energy efficiency, we fulfilled all these targets ahead of the 2020 target. And just right now, uh, the EU leaders with the EU Parliament have agreed on a binding EU target for domestic reduction of greenhouse emissions of 55% by 2030 compared to 1990. So we are more than doubling the objective that we had already committed to. In December 2019, they had, they had already endorsed the objective of being completely climate neutral by 2050. That means that maybe you have emissions, but they're offset by whatever you can eliminate. So essentially, carbon neutrality, climate neutrality by, by 2050. Um, the system that the EU is utilizing to fight carbon uh, emissions, to fight uh, climate change, is called a cap and trade system. Uh, the emission trading scheme of the European Union is a, is, a sort, is a one example of a cap and trade system. A cap and trade system works as follows. You put a cap. You say, next year we're going to emit X gigatons, each billion tons of CO2. Um, the cap then is reduced year by year so that we get towards the objective we have, eventually zero. And then, and here is the trade part of the cap and trade system, what you do is you um, allow, you give allowances that add up to the, to the cap. They can be purchased, they can be granted, and we see, we will see about that. And then companies decide to trade those allowances as they see fit. For a company for which it is very easy or relatively cheap to make an effort and cut CO2 emissions, and look at the right-hand side of the, of the, of the, of the PowerPoint and, and look at the installation one on it. Installation one has seen that it can decrease its carbon footprint relatively easier. And then it has a surplus of emissions. It has some emissions that it doesn't need, and it sells to this other company that has a complicated and big problem trying to reduce their emissions. This is the most efficient way to, to do it because to fight climate change and to reduce CO2 emissions, because we are getting the ones who are who find it cheaper to reduce their emissions to actually be the ones who reduce it. We get the exact amount of CO2 we want but we distribute the cost in a beneficent and smart way. Imagine that instead we assign to each company a particular cap, but we didn't allow them to trade. The problem is a company that maybe, you know, could have done a big effort and cut by half their emissions, given the permit they have, there's no advantage for them to do it because they cannot sell the permit, so they won't do it. And another company maybe has to reduce and it's very costly for them. So here we distribute the exact path that we are taking of reductions, we're distributing in the smarter way among uh, industries. Here, installation one is selling their surplus to installation two. Uh, the EU emissions trading scheme is a particular form of a cap and trade. Um, it is the first major carbon market. It was created in 2005, and it's 
really the biggest. It's not only EU-wide, it also covers Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway. It limits the emissions of 11,000 uh, heavy energy using installations, which doesn't sound like a lot, except that it covers 40% of EU greenhouse emissions. So it's, it's very significant in terms of the impact. Now, it has a problem. Uh, and the problem is the one that we're going to deal with today. So the cap decreases over time. Uh, the gigatons of uh, CO2 are being reduced over time. Between 2013 to 2020, they, they had a linear reduction of 1.74 a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. If you look at, at the previous graph that we had, 2.2% increase had led to this very, very large 34 to 49 uh, increase in, 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 those, in those years. So here we're going to be reducing by 1.74% a year. And that's going to lead to an increase in carbon price because there is less carbon emission permits to go around, so people are willing to pay more. In fact, look how sharply it increased in the last few years from 5 euros per ton equivalent of CO2 to uh, 30, uh, and then down to 25. Now, that sounds very good. I mean, it's what we want, right? We want to reduce the cap, and that's going to mean there is going to be an increase in the price of CO2 emission. Yes, true, that's why we want, but, and there is a big but. If you produce with an aluminum plant in, uh, some European city in Germany or some Spanish city like in Aviles, which has a steel plant, for example, in the north of Spain, you have to buy CO2 allowance. If you move this plant out of the EU and import the steel or whatever it is that you're producing, or the aluminum, you don't have to pay for the CO2 allowance. The importers are not covered. So as you see this increase in carbon prices, what you see is a big increase in what is called carbon leakage. Look what has happened. The European producers have reduced from a base of 100 to a 79. They have reduced 21% their carbon, their greenhouse gas emissions. But the amount of greenhouse gas in the imports has increased by 28%. Okay? Because I don't need... To if I produce the aluminum here, I'm going to have to be paying for each ton of CO2 that I generate 25 euros, I might as well produce the aluminum abroad. This is a disaster, right? From the perspective of the planet, it's a disaster. Because the planet gets us dirty or dirtier. We are importing it from other places. From the perspective of European producers, it's also a disaster. Because European producers are, and European jobs, the jobs are moving abroad. So a ETS system without something at the border to ensure that those outside also have an, an incentive to improve on CO2 is only going to change the emissions that we are not generating here for emissions that we are generating abroad. The jobs that are not here for jobs that are abroad. Not a very smart policy. So what is a CBA? Uh, think of the name. Carbon, carbon Border adjustment mechanism. It's a mechanism on the border. So we have a border, somebody's importing into the EU, and we say we're going to adjust the price of your goods according to what, how much carbon they have. It's like if the CO2 that people inside the union are paying a permit for, people outside the union need to also pay. Without the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the planet does not improve and production is moved up. With the carbon border adjustment mechanism, we're going to have other countries being also interested in pricing carbon and ensuring that they also reduce greenhouse gases. The idea is very well formulated in uh, William Nordhaus' uh, Nobel Prize speech in Stockholm, uh, in which he talked about the development of carbon clubs. Carbon clubs are um, the, following, uh, the following idea to solve free riding. We decide to make a little club. Think of a tennis club, okay? There's only a few members who can play. Here, there's a few members who can trade freely. This is the club. The club has a carbon pricing scheme. Everybody who is inside the club is paying for carbon 
we know that it's expensive for the planet, so people have to take into account that price, internalize it. They must commit to carbon neutrality. And obviously, since they are paying the carbon pricing, they are investing in climate demand. There's people who are not members. Right now, without the CBAM, if you're not a member, you're perfectly well sitting outside and not paying the CBAM, the, the ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme uh, price, the carbon price. Now we're going to tell to no members, no, no, you are going to be penalized for e exporting your products inside the club. You're outside of the club, the non-members, when they come to play tennis, they pay the fee. Okay? So the idea is, through the introduction of the CBAM, the non-members are encouraged to also invest in abatement of carbon, in fighting emissions, because otherwise they're going to have to pay when they get into the club. They will want, eventually, to join the club. If the price is sufficiently high, that will be the best solution. So that's the rationale. We have an ETS. We must fight the crime, climate change. Thus, we get an ETS. We get an ETS. We need, uh, if we have an emission trading scheme, we need an adjustment mechanism on the border to make sure that those who are not facing this carbon price also have to. What design should we use? As I was telling you, um, I was the rapporteur, which here in the European Parliament means the writer and the one who tries to get consensus for an opinion by the Committee of Economic and Monetary Affairs, where I'm the, the speaker for, for Renew uh, Europe, for, for my political group, the Liberal political group in Parliament, for uh, the design of this mechanism. And the opinion basically covers several aspects of design. It says what should be the aim of the mechanism, what instruments should be used, how, what coverage are brought, which products should be inside the mechanism, how should we assess carbon content? This is very tricky. And how should we fit it in with the emission trading scheme? We also, it's all designed to make it compatible with the trading uh, schemes in the world, with the trading agreements that we have with our partners. And we will make sure that that's the case. Let me just cover some of these issues. First, what's the um, objective of the carbon adjustment mechanism. The carbon adjustment mechanism must have a fisc a environmental and not a fiscal objective. It needs to be the case that it's clearly we are doing it for the environment. We're trying to do it to help our companies hurt the others. The World Trade Organization is going to tell us you're not allowed. You're not allowed to put tariffs. You are allowed to make others pay what you pay, but you're not allowed to make the others pay more than what you pay. So what are the design elements that we need? First, we need to make sure that we are um, mirroring the price being charged to EU producers. This is going to ensure that there is no discrimination, that it's a fair mechanism, that whatever you would be paying if you produce our aluminum in Aviles, you're going to be paying if you produce it in Morocco and vice versa. Second, um, you want to avoid importers pay twice for the carbon content. You want to tell them, look, country A or B, hey, look, Morocco or India. If you actually make an effort, your companies will be exempt. It's very important that you take into account what people are already paying in your design. Because if you tell them you're going to have to pay double, you will pay whatever you pay for carbon in your country, and then you will pay for getting into Europe, then what they will do is they, they will lobby their countries to, to be exempt, and then you will actually be doing yourself a very small favor, the opposite. And thus, it needs to allow importers to show what their real carbon emissions level is. They need to have a, a system that allows them to prove that they are already decarbonizing. <laughs> so what are the policy instruments that we can use? We could use a tax on consumption. We could say all the carbon that is consumed in Europe should pay a duty tax on consumption of carbon. This doesn't really work because it does not really address the risk of carbon leakage. I mean, we're still paying more if you're in Europe than in the US, than abroad, because you're paying the carbon tax and then you're you're again paying for the emission trading permits. It's technologically challenging. And we saw from what Macron suffered a few years ago with the Gilets Jaunes, we saw, we saw how the public and political support is not there. 
We could also put a customs duty, a tax on, on the border. And uh, this could be discriminatory because it's not going to ever be at the same level as the ETS. Sometimes it will be higher. People will say, well, if you produce at home, you pay five. If you produce abroad, you pay 10. That's not fair. Or we could third have an instrument based on the EU emission trading scheme. This idea is, look, we already have a price, and that's the price that people pay when they produce, when they generate carbon in Europe. Why don't we get the people abroad paying the exact same price? Um, this is going to be non-discriminatory by definition because they're paying the same. It is going to avoid burdening you producers um, that uh, already have to use the ETS. It's easy to approve because it's politically much easier and it also requires an easier right through the European institutions not being a tax, which are always extremely hard to pass in Europe. Third issue, the scope. What kind of products should be covered by the EU ETS? Our view in this opinion, and my view here, is that it should apply to all products. The same products that are covered in the EU ETS. And this is because if you pick and choose, you're going to actually introduce lots of distortions. First, let me ask you, let me explain you why this is a question. The question appears because some people say, look, um, if you start trying to do too much, if you start trying to apply it to the to all the products, then it's going to be very complicated and you won't achieve anything. They're right. It's tricky. But the alternative, in my opinion, is worse. First, if you only cover some products, then you get distortions. If cement, for example, which is um, uh, covered, um, or if ceramics, look, think, look at cement here. Imagine the cement is covered and not ceramic or bricks. Then people will just use the cement substituted by ceramic or by iron or by aluminum. Okay, there's many products here which could be substitutes of each other, um, could be in the same category. So you want to try to cover horizontally all the products that are covered by the mission training scheme. Similarly, um, if you vertically only cover the raw materials and not the products on which the raw material is, so you say, I will cover steel, but I won't cover the things made of steel, then people will just take steel production out of the European Union and they will um, avoid the coverage. You will distort along the value chains uh, because they know that they can import the cards without being, without being covered. Whereas if they import the steel, they would be have to pay if they import the entire car they don't have to pay so you need to cover the entire value chain from raw material to the end so um i was arguing as you see here that if you only cover uh, some products you're going to get substitution in the domestic market and if you only cover uh, the one the raw materials or the intermediate or the end products then you're going to get some distortions in the vertical chain. So it's technically a challenge, but I think that we should try to use to cover every product that is an emission trading skill, the scheme vertically and horizontally. Um, now, how on earth are we going to measure the carbon content of a car? That seems crazy. How can we do it? It's possible. And the European Economic and Social Council, which is formed by trade unions and by and employers, by industries, by small business, by everybody, uh, all the social agents, uh, actors, has made a proposal that I think is pretty reasonable for how to assess carbon content. It's very simple. You weight the product, you say how much is the weight of the raw materials, and then you multiply it by the carbon intensity of the raw materials. Think of we're doing this for medicine. We're doing this for food. In a food, we see how much curry is there, how much milk, how much cream, how much uh, chicken is there, right? Well, this will be the same. In a car, you have to know how much aluminum, how much steel, etc. And then once you have the weight, you multiply it by the carbon intensity. Let me give you a particular example, a car. So we have the weight of the car, okay? And we have 
how many kilos of steel, glass, aluminum, and plastic polyethylene does it have? The, the car, this particular car, is one and a half tons, and it's composed basically in terms of raw materials of steel, glass, aluminum, and plastics. Now, we know the greenhouse gas intensity of these materials, and it's here. Three kilos of CO2 per kilo of product for steel. Glass is much less carbon intensive, it's only 0 0.9. Aluminum, as you know, extremely energy intensive. It's three times as energy intensive, as CO2 intensive as steel. And polyethylene is more or less like steel. You multiply the weight by the intensity and you get the greenhouse carbon content. So this particular car of 1.45, 1,450 kilos is going to have 5,000 kilos of CO2 equivalent. Now, you use, you go to the ETS market, you see what's the price of a ton of carbon in Europe, and you say that's 25 euros per ton. So you multiply the five tons by 25, and you get that this car is going to have 126 euro of carbon border adjustment mechanism in the border. Okay, that's how the system would work. Um, now, there are a couple of details, and now it, it, I'm going to, to talk, tell you about a couple of technical details. If you have understood until now, you have the system. But there are a couple of technical systems that need to be um, taken into account. First, the ETS in Europe doesn't force you, the emission trading scheme, to buy carbon permits for all the carbon to you emit, only for part. Your objective is to reduce carbon leakage. Uh, we tell to the best and most efficient producers, you don't have to buy our allowances. We give them for free. So in Europe, the, ten, the level of CO2 emissions that correspond to the top 10%, for example, in the steel or in the aluminum industry, is for free. You only have to buy allowances for what is outside of that 10% more productive producers. Now, how do we articulate that with the CBAM? What we do is we abandon the free allowances over a transition period, little by little. So here we have the free allowances and the pay allowances at the start, and we're going to, little by little, be eliminating them. This is not a problem because you're not going to have a rush of imports since now the guys who are importing are going to have to pay the carbon border adjustment mechanism. As the carbon border adjustment mechanism, you reduce the imports. And they can perfectly coexist because you're going to, one is going to pay the, the CBAM, the other one is going to pay the ETS, and both are going to be net of the free allowances. In both cases, there is going to be a free allowance. Um, now, a second uh, issue is, what do we do abroad? We're eliminating the free allowance, but then the aluminum producer who has to produce outside, now is going to have to pay for carbon, maybe when he exports into China, into the US, there they don't have to pay for carbon. What do we do? We could introduce a system in which we give you back all that you paid in, car, in emission trading scheme permits. So all the permits when you export, we give them back. That sounds a priori very appealing, but it means that you can just dump all your carbon abroad. You are just an exporter. If you're a very dirty producer, you should just export. So bad idea. We could also not have any export rebate, but then we are very much disadvantaging our own producers. What we proposed is that you give an export rebate that is exactly the same as the free allowance would have been. So the level, the benchmark level of the 10% best producers, you can get a rebate for whatever carbon you paid so that the exporters, and this is the key thing to remember, the exporters are going to be neither better off nor worse off. They're going to be exactly the same. Okay. So I was telling you, we're going to, we're going to, in the domestic market, we are eliminating 
the free allowances so that at the end everybody has to buy a permit for all the carbon they pollute. In the export market, we're going to be little by little reducing the free allowances, the same as in the domestic market, but we're going to be increasing the export rebates simultaneously so that the exporters have neither those nor gain competitiveness as a result of this change. Okay. Now, the last issue that is very important and I think is going to be pretty persuasive to you is, is the system compatible with the World Trade Organization? Is the system comparable, compatible with the general agreement on tariffs and trade that we have signed as Europeans and that obliges you to two main issues? It obliges us to not discriminate between imported and domestic goods. It says that we must um, apply the same treatment to imported and domestic goods. In fact, the system that we've described is designed exactly to do that. Both domestic uh, producers and importers pay exactly the same carbon price. The transition period um, is exactly non-discriminatory because the free allowances are deduced from both, as I showed you. Both exporters and domestic markets are not in any way this, uh, having a discriminatory treatment. So, and also, we our system is going to give importers the opportunity to show the specific carbon content. You're going to get applied a general carbon content that everybody has to apply. If you are preferred, if you have if you have better technology, you can show it and pay less, thus giving you an, an incentive to reduce your carbon content, and thus also proving to the WTO that we're not trying to set up an import tariff, an import barrier. Second, the most favored nation clause is the second key principle of the GATT. The most favored nation clause says I can't treat one nation in a different way than another. If I'm charging the aluminum of one country in the one way, I should charge the aluminum in another country in the same way. As I showed you, um, this is exactly what the system does because it's the intensity is the carbon intensity uh, value times the material and the weight of the material is exactly the same system for all countries. Um, some in Europe prefer to just ignore the WTO and use an article on the GATT, which says Article 20, which gives you an exception for environmental objectives. This article says, look, if you're going to do something that is going to protect animal or plant or health life, or to conserve natural resources, and CO2 is clearly a natural resource, then you are not subject to this non-discrimination and, and most favored nation clauses. I believe that this is not and necessary. It's true that our system would easily be compatible with WTO applying Article 20. But Article 20 is like making a hole in the trading system. I think it's preferred to actually say, look, we are totally compliant with the world trading system. We're not discriminating against everybody. We're having a system that protects free trade, that encourages reductions in carbon leakage that are compatible with the basic rules of free trade. So, in that sense, I believe that this is a system that can work, a system that is um, um, implementable, that is economically reasonable, that doesn't discriminate against foreigners or put our own producers at, at, at risk, and that will complement the main objective here, which is fighting climate change. What does Europe have now to do in order to get this CBAM out of the door? So, as I told you, our committee has issued its opinion. Um, we are the committees whose opinion counts for the design of the system. Others, INTA is, is the one, the committee that does international trade and the um, and budget. Each one is going to have its own specialties. INTA has to do the international trade matters. Budget is going to be the one specifically concerned with what we do, we do with the money. It's going to be an own resource for the European Union, which I prefer. Is it going to be just the checks and back by the, to the countries? Different people have different preferences. Then the MD committee, the environmental committee, is going to integrate all these ideas and, and, and have an opinion, uh, a vote on, on the general uh, advice we give to the Commission. Then the Commission, the European Commission, is going to table a proposal. 
they are obliged to take into account their assessment and also the recommendations of the European Parliament. And then I would hope by 2023, um, this mechanism will be a reality. I hope that what we are proposing um, serves to move people and to change uh, what people want to propose. And I would really hope that by 2023, indeed, we have a system that is non-discriminatory, that is efficient, that allows us to contribute to the fight against climate change and protects, uh, to the extent necessary, our own industries. Now, I am happy to um, to take a couple of questions. I see that that I have a couple of questions. Let me uh, let me see. Wow, I have I have uh, I have quite a few there. Um, Inigo Torres, uh, Elena first asks, um, are all EU countries committed to introduction of the CBAM? Do you envision potential blocking minorities from some countries as it has happened with other EU measures? Um, I would say, Elena, um, I think that there is surprisingly huge level of agreement on this. If you think about it, the uh, firms, the uh, producers are happy because they eliminate discrimination. Trade unions are happy because jobs are not shipped out. The Greens, the people who care about climate, are happy because we're fighting climate change. There is really a very, very large consensus on this kind of system. Um, Inigo Torres asks, um, what incentive does a specific foreign company have to innovate and lower emissions if the current test is a country level? Good question, Inigo, but our proposal is that you set the incentive for country level, you allow people to prove they are better than the country level incentive. So they are better than, than the average. So if you have to pay, like in the example with steel, 3.5, and your that's your, your carbon intensity is 3.5 and, and you are able to produce a three you can prove it and you will be able to pay less it's a good question um, um javier garcia if one just milieu than two there it's always there's a, a good meal there we need uh, reciprocity i agree with that 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 is that is the objective indeed um and uh javier lopez moya Apart from the basic principle of non-discrimination and manifest, are there any other specific conditions that the CBIM must meet in order to be compatible with the rules? Um, I would say uh, the, the the main issues here are are. Uh, oh, I was trying to get I was trying to get rid of this, but I couldn't. Um, the main issues here are the two that that I have pointed out. If anything, the WTO gives us more latitude rather than less to to do it. We can actually go further than further than that. Um, I don't see more screens. I have, this, I have more questions. I have a screen that doesn't allow me to scroll down. But I think that uh, I think that this is these are the main questions that I had. If I'm missing anything, uh, Juan, do tell me or. Uh, um, so thanks a lot for uh, for your attention. I hope. Oh, uh, ah, are you expecting any kind of regulation from third countries? Bob Bernstein. Bob, uh, this is a great question. This is the really big question, right? So we have some risk of retaliation. I mean, there is a there is a um, uh, a risk that countries like you know China or the U.S. see this as an aggressive trade move. The thing is that in the system that I'm proposing, uh, Bob, and that the Econ Commission proposes, we are basically telling them, look. Um, we're, you're going to have the exact same regime, pay the exact same price that European producers are facing. So um, I, I, I think that this system is the one that is most likely to minimize retaliation. And our desire is for them to join a system like this. And our desire is for them to say, look, uh, it's in our interest to, to go in this direction and to have uh, a, a system that allows everybody to uh, contribute to this fight against um, global greenhouse gas emissions and reduce um, carbon uh, emissions and fight climate change. So I would hope that this is the system that is more likely to avoid retaliation. Um, so I don't think I have any more questions. I'll, I'm looking with the corner of the eye. Uh, 
this is basically what I had to tell you. I hope it was it was useful. I hope it was clear. I hope we managed to convince you that this is a solvable problem, and that we're going to uh, Europe is going to advance hopefully in a in a good direction in fighting greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks for your attention and.